Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 5, Many Atoms, Fluctuations in Kinetic and Potential Energy, Indistinguishability. I'm Professor Phillies and these are lectures on statistical mechanics based on my book Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics Springer Verlag 2000 okay so where we are is you've both given me some chapter 5 homework and I have a list of four problems for next time the problems are chapter 5 problems 6, 8, 9, and 11 and you will find that they are less calculational and more thought involved, and we may discuss them. Yes. Um, okay, so where we are is that you should have done a calculation of the mean energy and the mean square energy of an ideal gas. And I suppose the first question is if you could get the, the calculations to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you got the answers in the book. Yep, mm -hmm. they made total sense. Okay, in that case I will go over fairly quickly what you should have done and if nothing sounds unfamiliar we're in good shape. So, first of all we have n atoms in a box and so we have an ensemble which is a complete non-repeating list of all of the states of the system. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is find a method that generates that list and that's what the sum over states does. I mean, if we have a six-sided die and we go summation i equal 1 to 6, we generate a label which can be isomorphic with the die rolls. In this case, each atom has an x, a y, and a z coordinate, which can be anywhere in the box, and px, py, and pz can be any value from plus infinity to minus infinity. And so for each atom, when you generate the list, it's these this six real numbers that go over its, their allowed values. For n atoms, there have to be six numbers for each atom, so there are six n numbers, and hence you have a six n dimensional integral. Ditto when you you have to since we're going to have an ensemble, there's a requirement. There's an ensemble average. You have to be able to write down the energy of the system in terms of the mechanical variables. And so you had a sum P1x squared over 2m plus P1y squared over 2m plus P1z squared over 2m. So you should have written down the energy, and it would have had how many terms in the sum? Uh, 3n. I hear 3n. Do I have another bid? 6n. For the energy? Mm. Well, the, the volume terms are constant, but they're there. And they can't He's just them. asking about the energy. Oh, then. 3N. We have agreement. It's 3n. Because there are 3 p, n, p square over mm -hmm. 2m. And so when you write the statistical weight, there is this mystic constant c, and there's an exponential minus beta sum of the 3n energy mm -hmm. terms. And you should both have been able to take that exponential of this big sum and turn it into a product of 3n terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And the 3n terms distribute over integrals, so you have 3n integrals, integral from minus infinity to infinity dp, mm -hmm. e to the minus beta mm -hmm. p square over 2m. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And all of them are the same, Except if you're taking an average of the energy, well, there are three n energy terms, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your ensemble average over the energy yeah. can be written as a sum of three n terms, That's each of which is the ensemble average over one of the P1 P1 mm -hmm. x squared over 2n. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that term in the ensemble average, it contains 
3n integrals dp, and one of those integrals dp has a p square over 2m in it, and the other 3n minus 1 didn't. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, they're the numerators, and what can we say about the numerators in all of these 3n terms? They're all identical except for the variable that you're integrating. You've done the cancellation at this point. Yep. Okay. Then, then we can Before just... you do the cancellation, what can you say about all of the numerate denominators? The numerators or the denominators? The denominators. They're all the same. They're yep. all the same, right. They're all the partition function. Yep. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have this integration, and you have 3n terms which are all the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you integrate the three n terms that are all the same, each of them gives you just what it did with the one dimensional, the mm -hmm. one and mo molecule box. It gives you kT over two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for the t total energy, you should have found and kT over two. Is the total? Or How many terms were there? Three n. And each of which is kT over 2. 3 n kT over, over 2. two. Okay. Yep. Now you calculate the square of the energy. Mm -hmm. And the square of the energy is 3n terms times 3n terms is how many terms? 9n squared. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. But all of those terms, for all the, there are a rather large number of them, like 10 to the 47th. You know, that's a healthy number. It's more than you would want to count one at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fall into two groups. Okay. Because they're the groups where the first p square over 2m and the second p square over 2m have the same label. So you have squared terms and cross terms. Yep. Yes, you have the squared terms and you have the cross terms. And you do one cross term, and all of the rest are the same. And you do one yeah, squared sure. term, and they're all the rest are the same. Yep. And then you add them up. Yep. yep. And when you add them up, you get a value for the means for the... 15 over 4 kT squared. For atoms, you get, yeah. you get n for the kB squared over 4, and then for the cross terms, you get n times n minus 1. 3kb squared over 4, if I remember correctly. Well, let us peek in the book. Mm. And each cross term is 3kt over 2 squared. And each individual term is kt over 2 squared. Mm -hmm. uh, or well, no, no, wasn't the square, the square terms are 3 and the cross terms are 1? Did I say no. it backwards? Yes, you, uh, the, yes the, the, the self terms are each 15 fourths kT yeah. squared. Yep. And the cross terms are 3 kT over 2 squared, yep. or yep. 9 fourths. Yep. And there are exactly n of the self terms, mm -hmm. and there are n times n minus 1 of the cross terms. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you combine it all, you discover there are n square of one term, and there are n of another term. Mm -hmm. And that's equation 5-26. Yeah. And then if you cranked the arithmetic, it's not very hard arithmetic, you get equations 527, 528, and 529. I yep. have a question for 529, though. Is yes. it supposed to be the square root of um, the average value of e squared minus e, the square of the average over the average of e, or is it just supposed to be e? It should be the average of E. That's okay. actually a typo, which no one has ever noticed before. No, okay. we have it. That makes a lot more sense. However, if you knew where you were getting, you could work out where the typographic error in the equation is. Namely, it should be E average, not That's E. That's what I did for the homework. Yep. So. Yep. Good. And w yeah. So let us ask... E, e is just P squared over 2N. That didn't make sense to divide by. Yes. So let us actually... And now I will put in a bit of lecture for a moment. 5-27 is e square minus e average square. Another way of writing 527, the left side of it, is that it is e minus e average squared averaged. That is 527 gives you the 
mean square value of the deviation of e from its average value. Mm -hmm. it's, the so it's the fluctuation. Mm -hmm. And you see that the fluctuation is growing linearly with n. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the next thing you could say is what is the size of the fluctuation energy? That is, what is the um, typical fluctuation in the energy away from its average value? And that's 528, which is the square root of 527, and that's n to the one-half. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And finally, there's 529, which is the fractional size of the fluctuation. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the flat fractional size of the fluctuation is to ask, how big is the energy fluctuation relative to the average energy? <coughs> now, I should stress that in all of these, I am saying the energy, but this is always an ideal gas, and so we are looking at the fluctuations in the kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. That is not a trivial point, because if you had a system of interacting particles, you would also have fluctuations in the potential energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like the plasma in a box. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So having said this, let us um, go on to the next section and ask what the physical significance of this is. And the answer is, in order to understand the significance, we have to look at different types of experiment. Mm -hmm. And there are three basic classes of experiment that we can point at. Uh, this discussion, or a similar discussion, is found in most statistical mechanical mechanics books, except it was written by people who didn't think very carefully about what types of experiments were available. So we'll start with what I call experiments of the first kind. For example, weighing something. If I take a couple of pennies, they, or a, bu a bunch of pennies, they have a weight, which might be 50 grams. If I take them and put them on a milligram or tenth milligram balance, I can weigh the 50 milligrams to one part in four of a gram, so I'm doing a measurement that is close to a part in ten to the six. Similarly, if I have a moving van, as they used to do the load charges for moving vans, you take the moving van, you put it on a, a truck scale, and we have this truck that might weigh 60,000 pounds, or 40,000 pounds, and we can weigh it with an accuracy of a fraction of a pound. And that's important because the charge is by the pound, and you want to know exactly how many pounds the truck weighs. Again, the measurement accuracy is a part in 10 to the 5 or better. If you wanted to shove ahead to higher accuracy with what is basically an analog measurement, you have to work hard. You can weigh something to an accuracy of, oh, one part in 10 to the 8 using a balance. But you have all sorts of difficulties. For example, depending on the air pressure and the humidity, those balance weights and the object you have on the balance um, well, they experience a buoyant force due to the air, just as if you submerge them in water, they experience a buoyant force, buoyant force. Now, the first problem with that is that the buoyant force depends on the density of the object, so unless the thing you're trying to weigh is made of platinum or iridium, like your ideal standard balance weights, the buoyant forces on the two objects will not be the same. Second, to make life more interesting, as the barometer changes and the hygrometer, the measurement of air humidity in the room change, and the room temperature change, the buoyant forces change too, and you have to put in air pressure and humidity corrections. There are other interesting corrections. For example, you might have to worry, even though it's platinum iridium, that there's a certain tendency of the metal to oxidize at least a trifle. And therefore, the balance probably doesn't have quite the mass it did. 
you do, there's one thing you don't have to worry about, which is the local force of gravity, because that doesn't see, change with time, and even if it does, a beam balance works just fine. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, having said this, even though a beam balance works just fine, um, if your standard weights and the object you were weighing were a distance apart, well, eventually you have to start worrying that the Earth's gravity is a function of position on the planet Earth. But it is a very weak function of position, so that's not an issue. Okay, so we can get out and do measurements with maybe accuracy of part in 10 to the 8. Now let's ask, compare that with fluctuations in the energy, the kinetic energy of all of the atoms in the room. Not one atom relative to its own energy, all of them. And the fluctuations are some size given by equation 5-28. They're sort of square root of n times a number times kt. Well, square root of the number of atoms in this room is quite big, isn't it? It might be 10 to the 12. That's big. However, your measuring instrument has an error. And the error is a fraction of the size of the quantity it's measuring, like one part in 10 to the 8 if we work hard. Now, if we can measure the energy of one atom within a part in 10 to the 8, the fluctuation in that energy is something of about the same size, and we can easily see it. However, as we... Um, Increase, look at, increase the number of atoms in the room, the total energy goes up, and we have to measure that total energy, and our instrumental error is a constant fixed percentage of the um, total energy in the room. The total energy of the room goes up, but the fluctuations only grow much more slowly. The energy grows as n to the first, the fluctuation grows as square root of n, and therefore the fractional size of the fluctuations, 5-29, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And because the fractional size of the energy fluctuations gets smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually it, it, as it shrinks enough relative to total energy, that it's smaller than the instrumental error and becomes undetectable. Follow the argument? Mm -hmm. This is the standard argument. Now, the um, standard argument says, therefore, statistical mechanical fluctuations are not observable because they're too small to be seen. Now, there are, two problem, there are three problems with that claim. First of all, you might say, I'll just make the system smaller. Yes? Mm -hmm. But there is a dodge, and the standard dodge is we often use statistical mechanics to compute things like free energy. And the way we do measurements of things like free energy in the theory is we take the thermodynamic limit what is the thermodynamic limit? It's the limit that the system becomes infinitely big. And if the system is infinitely big, then you can't make it very small at the same time. That's the first problem. Now, the second problem with the argument is that sometimes you're interested in smaller systems rather than infinitely large ones. And in those cases, if the system is not infinitely big, uh, gee, there are fluctuations. The third problem is people keep building better and better scientific instruments. And so you might have said, well, weighing something to one part and ten to the six, that can't be done, so there's now no issue. But an upper-class chemistry lab will have a milligram balance in it, self-tearing even. And guess what? Even undergraduates can do that. Okay, now we come to the other two issues. 
and the other two issues are the two other sorts of experiment. The second sort of experiment, which I call experiments of the second kind, refer to the issue that there's some sorts of processes which really don't have errors in them, at least if you use really redundant electronics. If I am doing a counting experiment and I can detect the objects reliably, for example, counting cars on an, a one-lane section of the interstate, yes, and the electronics are redundant, I can count as high as I want and there are no errors. Now, of course, if my detector isn't very good, the fact that I'm doing counting doesn't mean there aren't errors, and there are these things called hanging chads. Does the phrase ring a bell? The 2000 presidential election? And if your counter isn't reliable enough, you can run into problems, but if the counter is reliable, is there a truck coming through or is there not a truck coming through? There is absolutely no problem having experiments in which there is no error. And because there is no error, there is no difficulty in making completely precise measurements. You see what happens? Well, people do, if you're doing analog measurements, that can't happen, because analog measurements are intrinsically error-prone. But with digital counting, you could, to some extent, get around this issue. Okay? Now we come to another piece of experiments of the second kind. I'm going to be somewhat clever. I'm going to do what in, is called AC coupling, if you're using a normal, old-fashioned oscilloscope. What is AC coupling? We have this oscillating, fluctuating signal, and we'd like to be able to see it on the oscilloscope. However, we have this low voltage fluctuation, and it's on top of 100 kilovolts DC. And if you set the oscilloscope scale so it can, you see the 100 kilovolt signal, fluctuation has been squinched down to nothing. That's an experiment of the first kind. How do I solve this embarrassing difficulty? Why? I take a capacitor. I put the capacitor between the signal and one of the two input pole jacks of the oscilloscope. This does absolutely nothing to the AC signal, assuming it's a good capacitor and not too big, so it charges fast. But, it's a capacitor. I can have a DC voltage here, but if there's a capacitor along one of my lines, on the far side of the line, the voltage difference between these two things is zero, going to be zero. Because the capacitor only lets the AC signal through, it does not let the DC signal through. I can test this very easily by um, grabbing the two poles with my hands. This would be inadvisable if there were 100 kilovolts between them. However, I am downstream of the capacitor and the current flow through me will be negligible and therefore this is perfectly safe. Do not try this in your own kitchen. Oh. You see, the AC coupling eliminates the um, voltage gap and if I turn up the gain in the oscilloscope, I can now see the signal. Yes? Mm -hmm. Now, there are issues with this because the capacitor may have leakage. That is, we're saying it's a capacitor, no current flows, but real capacitors also have a resistance like 100 mega ohms or whatever. And there will be some current leakage through. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? And I now come to experiments of the third kind, I guess. There are measurement techniques that are directly sensitive to the fluctuations and can't tell that the average value is there. Where have you ever seen a, 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 a something that is directly sensitive to the fluctuations? 
why you look outside and look up at the sky. And you will notice these blue pa abnormal blue patches. No, that is not the sky coming down with gangrene because of air pollution. That is the actual color of real sky. Why is there, why is there, if you go to the moon, you don't have any of this nonsense. On the moon, the sky is black, except where there are stars. But on Earth, the sky is luminous because light from the sun chugs along, it hits the Earth's atmosphere, and it's scattered in all directions, including some that is scattered down to us. Furthermore, it is scattered selectively so that blue light is scattered and red light isn't, so that the sky looks a sort of a fuzzy blue-white. The very intense blue that you get is the physiological sky color. That's actually much more complicated. <clears throat> but why does the sky scatter light? And the answer is the air is not perfectly uniform. There are more air molecules here and fewer air molecules there, and non-uniform objects scatter light, even though uniform objects do not. And because the non-uniform objects scatter light, the sky glows. There are experiments that are directly sensitive only to the fluctuations and give a signal that's proportional, typical value, to the mean square fluctuation size. Therefore, you can measure fluctuations directly. There's another example of this which is a little different. Uh, specific heat. As we will see in a bit, the specific heat in the system is linearly proportional to the size of the energy fluctuations. And therefore, if I measure the specific heat, I'm measuring the mean square kinetic energy fluctuations. So far so good? Nothing over the head yet. Okay. Um, okay, so that's fluctuations. Uh, standard texts sort of ask you to explain why you can't see fluctuations, and the answer is sure you can make the system small, and sure you can use the right technology. Okay. Now let's push ahead to a somewhat different fluctuation. And so first I have to say something about thermodynamics, not very much. Suppose I have solid ice and water in contact with each other, yes? As the ice melts, you have less ice and more uh, water, okay? However, as the ice melts, <clears throat> if we're at equilibrium, we're at zero degrees C, and after the ice has melted, we're still at zero degrees C. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can change the amount of liquid ice relative to, or solid ice relative to liquid water without changing the temperature, as long as we stay at constant pressure. Now, you can also arrange this so you have solid ice, liquid water, and water vapor, and nothing else present. You put the, them in a tube, you seal, you vacuum pump the tube, you seal the tube, and you now have ice and water and vacuum that fills up with water vapor in contact with each other. It turns out that this can happen but it can't but it can only happen at one temperature triple point of water precisely the triple point and furthermore you have to get the amount of water in your tube vaguely right or the tube has all liquid water and no solid or something or all mm -hmm. solid and no liquid but as long as all three phases are present you are at a fixed pressure and a fixed temperature but not fixed relative amounts of solid, liquid, and gas. That's why you can be at any temperature and pressure. Now let us suppose I construct my triple point temperature thermometer as follows. 
I have a vertical column sealed at the top and the bottom. And I fill it up with the triple point substance. And above that is a single molecule. A single molecule, the shape of the piston that fills the whole tube. And therefore, all of the water, or whatever it is, is confined down here. Up here is just a vacuum. And if I have chosen the weight of this object correctly, its force downwards on the triple point liquid matches the pressure of the va vapor of the water, and everything just sits there, yes? Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. But suppose I push the piston down or raise it up. What's going to happen? Well, some of the liquid water or solid water is going to turn to gas. And if I raise the piston, I will have more and more gas and less and less liquid water and solid water. Mm -hmm. Or if I push the piston down... The gas becomes liquid or solid? Yes. However, these are all equilibrium states of the same system. Mm -hmm. If I move the piston up and down, how much work am I doing on the piston? None. None. Why none? Because the force of gravity down and the force of water vapor pressure up sum to zero. So I do need to do no work to move things up and down. Yes? Mm -hmm. And so these are all equilibrium states of the same system. Even to emphasize equilibrium. They're all in the ensemble. And therefore, there are different states of the ensemble, statistical mechanical ensemble for this system, in which the piston is at all different heights. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yep. Mm -hmm. So would that be an adiabatic procedure? Uh, no, if you want to do this, you have oh, okay. to melt the ice and vaporize the liquid. Uh, it's it very definitely not. The system is very definitely not isolated. Okay. In fact, the question is, what is the efficient way to raise the piston? Answer, apply a blowtorch briefly to the system. You will vape, melt the ice, vaporize the water, and the piston will go up. And if you do apply the blowtorch reversibly, that is very, very gently, the whole thing is reversible. Uh -huh. However, okay, now let's consider first the kinetic energy. In the kinetic energy calculation, or the average value of the kinetic energy, the total energy has an exponent, has a term U, which is the pot intermolecular potential energy. Mm -hmm. Check. Mm -hmm. um, and if the molecules are closer together, like in a solid, the um, potential energy has a value that is probably very different from the potential energy in the gas mm -hmm. when the molecules are far apart. But if I want to calculate the kinetic energy of this thing, this is a homework problem due to due Wednesday, what does the potential energy term do to the average value of the kinetic energy? If potential goes up, kinetic goes down, or vice versa. Does nothing. Got it nothing. There is an exponential minus beta u, where u is the total potential energy. It's integrated over 3n times for the 3n position coordinates. But the integrals in the denominator and the numerator are the same. Cancels. And they yes, they cancel out. And therefore, um, the, potential en the potential energy has no effect on the average value of the kinetic energy. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you ask, what is the average value of the kinetic energy as you move the piston up and down with your blowtorch and your liquid helium spray, the answer is the average value of the kinetic energy does not change so long as you are at the triple point. That's true. Because we're only, t we're only dealing with the kinetic energy, we, we're not summing over the potential as well. Mm -hmm. However, this is explained in Gibbs' book. Gibbs explains a lot of things well, and explains things that other people did not pay attention to. The fluctuations in the kinetic energy were small, 
What about the fluctuations in the potential energy? Well, if we had solid ice, the atoms are all bonded to each other and stuck to each other and attached. There's a lot that potential energy is quite negative. On the other hand, if we're almost all gas because the piston is way up here, the atoms are almost all way far apart from any other atom, and their potential energy has gone to zero. And so the potential energy in different states can be very different, but all of those states are in fact e sort of equally likely, the ones we've been discussing. And therefore, potential energy fluctuations can be quite big. Okay, this is a section in the book we discuss potential energy fluctuations and the core issue is that potential energy fluctuations can be large even though kinetic energy fluctuations can't. Okay, hmm So, of course, some of those states are less likely than others, but they're allowed in a certain sense. Okay, let us chug ahead. Oh, oh, that's right. You may ask, well, how can the fluctuations be big um, if the um, energy of the gas, if e to the minus beta u of the gas molecules is very different for piston down here and piston up there. If e to the minus beta u has very different values, how can those states all have the same probability, more or less? It's because, it's because of the distribution in the denominator. That's sort of true, but there's another issue. Okay. The total energy of the system also has the potential energy of the piston as you raise it up and down. Mm. And if you lower the piston, you're increasing the potential energy in the solid and liquid objects, but you're reducing the potential energy of the piston. And those two exactly cancel because the process of raising or lowering the piston, the two energies cancel. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we come to the last bit of chapter 5. And the last bit of chapter 5, which goes on a bit, asks an important question about what the sum of states is and what the list of all allowed states is. And the notion is as follows. Here are two atoms. And you can tell them apart. And so if I switch the two atoms, clearly it's a new state of the system. Here are another two atoms. They're identical. You can't tell them apart. So is this a new state or is it the same state we've had already? It's the same state. That's a sensible answer. But they're not because it's not the same atom in the same spot. The atoms are in but different we, spots. But we can't That's tell. a sensible answer too. There are two sensible answers and one of you gave one of them and one of you gave the other. And one of you said they're identical. These two states are identical. And the other of you said I can watch this character switching papers back and forth. I can read the little labels on the atoms and therefore this and this are two different states. Well, if the atoms are identical, we don't have those labels. Well, that does lead to a question. Suppose we have identical atoms, you know, like oxygen atoms. Um, it is not that on the day of creation someone went into each oxygen atom and machined a serial number on it. So are these states the same or not? Well, there were two great 19th century physicists who wrestled with this question, Boltzmann and Gibbs.
And what Boltzmann said is that no matter how slowly you work and how careful you are, you have to do at least some work to switch two atoms, one for the other. And therefore, this state and this state are not the same. And when I count states of the system, states in which two identical particles are interchanged really count as the same state. That's what Boltzmann said. Gibbs said, well, it seems in the spirit of things that if the two states are the same because the atoms are indistinguishable, if the two arrangements are the same, it must count as one and only one state. That does seem to be the alternatives, doesn't it? Well, it turns out this question matters for reasons we haven't quite gotten to yet. And Gibbs was correct and Boltzmann was incorrect. Gibbs said correctly, you switch two identical atoms and you've somehow basically gotten back where you started. It's the same state. And he then discusses what would happen if you use the alternative assumption. Namely, you could have two identical tanks of gas connected by a pipe. Yes. And you move a piston, in, a, a slider in and out between the two identical tubes, opening or blocking the pipe, even though there's no pressure across it. And in essence, if you do this, you can use it to power a steam engine. Well, that's not true. There's no temperature gradient. You can't use it to power a steam engine. And so we ask, where, where did things go wrong? And the answer is, there's an object called the Gibbs Paradox. The Gibbs Paradox is what happens if you assume the atoms can be distinguished, so when you switch them back and forth, something happens, and there two, there's a state like this, and a state like this, and they're different. Now, we, I should point out a few little historical details of the Gibbs Paradox. It is not due to Gibbs. It is not found in his book. Gibbs did not think there was a paradox here because Gibbs was get, got the right answer and in the, if you get the right answer on counting states there's no issue. You will however find groups of books saying Gibbs paradox cannot be explained without the use of quantum mechanics. And that statement is half true if you invoke quantum mechanics, which says that I have two identical particles. What do I have to do to the wave function? Inverse it. I have to symmetrize it or anti-symmetrize it. Symmetrize it if they're bosons. Anti-symmetrize it if they're, phon if they're fermions. And once I've symmetrized, if they're two identical bosons like this, once I've symmetrized the wave function, there's only one symmetric wave function. And so this and this are part of the same state. Okay. Well, that's nice. And Gibbs is right. But having said, Gibbs is right. What are we going to do when we do the sum over states? There's a problem with our sum over states. Well, there are two problems. <coughs> the first problem is we'll do this in two dimensions. x1, the coordinate of this atom, takes this atom anywhere on the line. x2, the coordinate of this atom, takes this atom anywhere on the line. And so if I just do integral dx1, integral dx2, I generate this. And somewhat later, I generate that. And you notice the sum over states we have generates this and this twice. Once like this, once like that. You divide it by two. You divide by two. However, suppose I had three atoms. Mm, there's somewhat more because there's one like this. And the third atom is here. There's three atoms in a triangle. We could do this, we could do this. We could do this, we could do this, we could do this, or this. So it's by n squared. Mm, clever guess, but no. Okay. 
So how many states do we generate by mistake? Well, I have n atoms, yes, mm -hmm. and they have n locations. Mm -hmm. So the first atom I can put into any of the n locations. Now this is not I can physically put it into any of the n, this is the counting I can put it into any of the n. So I have one atom in each of these places. Oh, I see mm -hmm. it now. It's the unfactorial. The second atom, I only have n minus 1 spaces left. And so it's n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3. So it's n factorial is the overcount. Yes? Mm -hmm. You got it right. Now, now, when I was an undergraduate, I worried about the following issue. If I put it here, I have n minus 1 left. But what if I put the first atom here and the second atom there? And does it matter? And I eventually wrote out the combinatorics for not a very large number of atoms. And the answer is, it doesn't matter where you start, where you say the first atom has any of n places. It's still n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and it works mm -hmm. out. So you divide by n factorial. But there's a problem with that one, too. Here are the two atoms. They don't interact with each other. Yes? They can be in the same position. They're in exactly the same place now. And if you look at that integral dx1, dx2, it only generates this state how many times? Once. Once. Once? So I have accidentally miscounted this one state. That's potentially bad, isn't it? However, x1, given I fixed x2 here, x1 can be anywhere along there. There is only one point along the line at which x1 and x2 are in the same place. And so the measure, the ratio of this to this, is the number of points on a real line relative to the num to a single point, and that ratio is infinity. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, the um, inverse of that ratio is zero. Yep. And therefore, um, while there is a mistake being introduced, it's a mistake of measure zero relative to the total error. So it more or less doesn't matter? It does not matter at all. Okay. Uh, let me give an example of that. We are going to take an integral from 0 to 1 of two functions. And one of the functions is 1 along the whole line. Yes. Mm -hmm. The second function is 1, except at the point x equals 1 half, at which it's 0. What is the, what is the relative value of the two integrals? Both one. They're the same because one point doesn't have any effect, has literally no effect. Mm -hmm. Now a more amusing point is we will exclude not just one point, we will exclude every point whose value can be expressed as a fraction a over b. It has to be a fraction between 0 and 1. So I have excluded an infinite number of points. What happens to the value of the integral? Nothing, because the measure of the count of integers is nothing relative to the measure of the count of real numbers. Mm -hmm. So there is an error, there is a logical error there, but it is an error that has an effect of size zero. Of size zero. Mm -hmm. Now I shall briefly pause. You both had quantum, haven't you? Yes. I took it last term into quantum two now. Okay. In quantum mechanics, there are a certain finite number of states. I'm about to do a cheat to make a point. And if you, for example, are loading electrons into orbitals around an atom, there are limits to how many electrons you can put into each orbital. Two, as a matter of fact, spin up and spin down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we start doing the counting of states in quantum mechanics, where there are restrictions on how many things can be here or there, and there is only a finite list of possible states. That's not true of all quantum problems. Uh, at that point, this counting issue actually comes up, and you better actually generate the list of states. 
because the 1 over n factorial refers to classical variables. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we have now covered identical particles. Sort of. Um, so far so good? We have done the second half of chapter 5, and I have given you homework. Yep. Um, chapter 5 is not, um, um, this piece of chapter 5 is not calculationally very difficult once you see what's going on, but it's conceptually a little hard to get used to. Oh, go, getting back to the n factorial and quantum. If you are doing quantum of electrons and orbitals or whatever, you do not just blindly stick in the 1 over n factorial. It refers only to classical variables. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have basically finished with chapter 5. I will tell you what is in chapter 6 so you can read it. And we will do chapter 6 next time in detail. Uh, but we're sort of in the place where there are things where you ought to be reading the book very carefully and asking, do I really understand what I just read? Mm -hmm. So, chapter 6 asks a question. Okay, what is the pressure of the gas in this room? Yes? What is the pr what, how do we get the pressure? And I give you three calculations for getting the pressure. The first calculation is, if you think way back to lecture one, I said there were two basic laws of nature. And one was the statistical weight you assign to a given state. And the second was that the partition function Q is equal to exponential minus beta A where A is the Helmholtz free energy. Mm -hmm. So if you calculated the partition function, which you have, you take exponential, you take, you take a logarithm and you multiply by minus one and you divide out the beta and you are left with the Helmholtz free energy, a free thermodynamic free energy. Yes? Well, partial of A with respect to V up to a sign is the pressure. It's partial of A with respect to V, but you keep constant how many gas atoms there are, and you keep constant the temperature, and the change of A with respect to V gives you pressure. Yes. Oh, we're approaching 2 o'clock. Yes. And my apologies. Well, very briefly, and there are two other ways to do this, and one is to say these atoms are bouncing off the wall. Let's compute a short, over a very short period of time how many molecules ram the wall and how hard, and that's how much momentum they dump into the wall. And the third is, let's actually compute the force on the wall. We are now done. If you get the screen.